Dear friends, welcome to the show Talk with your doc. I am Dr. Prashant Jani and our guest for today uh, guest for today is uh, Caroline Fanti. Uh, she is a physiotherapist at Thunder Bay Regional Health Science Center and she is also program director of Regional Orthopedic Program. Thank you Caroline for coming to the show. Thank you Dr. Jani. Uh, please tell me about what is your role responsibility at the hospital here in Thunder Bay Regional. What do you do here? Uh, yes, so as the program director, my responsibility is to ensure that services for any orthopedic problem across northwestern Ontario is accessible and equitable for patients irregardless of where they live. Uh, we've been designated a musculoskeletal center of excellence in order to be able to expedite care for patients with specific conditions. Uh, this started with hip and knee but has now expanded to spine and shoulder as well and we hope to expand to additional uh, conditions in the near future. So among uh, all the other conditions you might be seeing patients with the back pain coming very often to your clinic probably. Yes, I have oversight over our clinic. I'm not uh, providing uh, direct patient care too often myself, uh, but have uh, developed the infrastructure for the various programs that we have and the team that we have providing care. You've seen that backache is a very common problem everywhere and many patients uh, get referred to a physician for the backache condition. So uh, what do you uh, want to say about backache, like the acute and chronic type of backache? So how do you dis distinguish between them? Uh, certainly, uh, I mean, it depends on the duration that people have had symptoms. Um, some of the programs that we run are aimed at providing rapid access and early management and providing patients with education on how to manage their symptoms, get them under control and prevent them from coming back and help them to understand their condition so that they don't have so much anxiety around it. So when do you call some pain as acute pain, like it originated within weeks? And then when do you call it as a chronic, like it lasts for months? or? Yeah, chronic would be something that's not resolving after approximately three months. Mm -hmm. 80% yeah. of patients uh, will typically experience an episode of back pain at some point in their lifetime. Okay. So what are the causes of the acute back pain? Like somebody gets acute pain, what, what can, be, can go wrong with it? Uh, it really depends on, on the age group and the mechanism or type of injury. It can be related to muscle, could be related to a disc herniation, an, an overuse injury, a fall or a trauma. Yeah, and then the chronic pain, what might be the cause or risk factor for the chronic pains? Uh, it could be simply a pain that isn't uh, well managed um, up front. Um, you know, back pain does require some dedicated self-management and, and self-care and sometimes some changes to lifestyle and more chronic conditions can develop uh, with certain um, degenerative changes, um, uh, you know, uh, injury upon injury, so to speak. Yeah, so the cause can be into the bone or with the muscle or the nerves around it can cause back, back pain? Yes, we, we try not to focus too much on structure because it's very difficult to determine what is the structure causing pain. There isn't a test that will typically tell us. We typically use a thorough assessment of movement patterns to determine uh, what movement patterns are aggravating, what movement patterns are easing to help guide the patient. So when a patient with the backache comes to uh, your clinic here at the hospital, how does he, uh, he's treated? Like what are the investigations done and what is the protocol here at the hospital? So we typically ask primary care providers such as family physicians and nurse practitioners to refer their patients to our uh, Isaac or low back pain program. Please tell us about the Isaac program. What it, is this program about? Isaac stands for Interprofessional Spine Assessment and Education Clinics. And it's a program that started in 2012. We were one of three pilot sites in Ontario. And it has now been expanded across the entire province because it's been quite successful in preventing patients from being becoming chronic and helping them manage their pain by providing them with a rapid assessment. We, we see patients typically under four weeks. I remember going through the Isaac program myself when I had a back pain. So tell us like when the patient comes, they have to fill a questionnaires about, uh, so what is this all questionnaires about? What? Yes, there are a few questionnaires that we have patients provide uh, information on how much impact the pain is having on their lifestyle and that way we can actually measure change over time 
And the goal of the program is to prevent the pain from becoming chronic and in, encourage patients to um, do dedicated uh, lifestyle and management uh, approach to their back pain. So somebody who approaches our hospital for the Isaac program, once you fill the questionnaires, then what happens next? Then there's, uh, well, they're referred uh, from their primary care provider first. We typically see them within two to four weeks of their referral. Mm -hmm. When they come to the clinic, uh, could, there are multiple clinics in the city that are affiliated with the low back pain program. Mm -hmm. They can see a chiropractor or physiotherapist that's part of our program. We spend one hour with the patient doing a thorough history, physical examination, and then providing them with education and a, a dedicated daily treatment plan. And then the opportunity for follow-up should they not feel that they're improving. And also the opportunity to fast track them to a surgical consultation with one of our surgeons if we feel that if the condition required. will require surgical intervention, which is typically less than 5% of patients. So once uh, somebody is referred from the primary care physician, how long it takes to go through the program? So from time of referral from primary care for the Isaac program, it's typically less than four weeks to four be weeks. seen. Right. And then if surgical consult is indicated, it could take another six to 12 weeks to see a surgeon. It really depends on the condition and how we prioritize it. So one of the module in this is the physiotherapical treatments, probably the exercise and all this recommendation. Yes. And what is the success rate of this program? The patient satisfaction scores mm -hmm. have consistently been in the 97 to 98% range. Mm -hmm. We were actually affiliated with University Health Network and a very dedicated research team that studied the patient satisfaction and also the satisfaction of primary care providers and how happy they were with our program. And it's been very high. And this is why the Ministry of Health rolled it out across the province. So this program, anybody can get benefit of it, young or old, or everybody's eligible for the program? There are certain specific eligibility criteria that primary care, we ask the, the primary care providers to take about a 10 minute online course to become rostered and be able to refer to the Isaac program so that they understand what criteria patients must fall within in order to be eligible. Right. Uh, now, once goes, somebody gets treated through the Isaac program for the low back pain, and uh, he does the, is there any follow-up afterwards? So it is an assessment and education program, and we don't offer treatment, but if treatment in the community is, is recommended and advised, then we encourage patients and provide lists of different community supports that they could seek. Right. And certainly, if they aren't improving within six weeks, we'll bring them back for a follow-up and reassess. How many patients you see in your office with a low, low back pain enrolling for this program? Any numbers? Oh gosh, it's, uh, it's quite prevalent. I think we have capacity to see about 20 to 25 patients per week at the, at the present time. And you see enough or you get more requests for it? Well, we are, we are meeting our wait times for it, yes. And uh, if we were not meeting our wait times, then we would just um, add providers. We'll take a short break and we'll continue our discussion in the next part. Okay, great. Please stay back for the next part. Thank you. Welcome back to the show, Talk With Your Doc. Um, our guest for today is Carol Infanti. She's a physiotherapist at Thunder Bay Regional and she's a program director for a regional orthopedic program. Uh, Caroline, we were mentioning about low back pain and Isaac program. Somebody has a severe backache at home or at work. What should they do the first thing? Uh, that, well, that's a good question. <laughs> You're putting me on the spot with that one. Um, so um, back pain can be managed um, at home with um, the right amount of balance between rest and activity, over-the-counter medications such as Tylenol, extra strength, and anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. Uh, medications, uh, gentle movement, perhaps walking, swimming if it's tolerated, use of heat or ice, um, and also accessing support in the communities, be it physiotherapy, acupuncture, chiropractic care, massage. And then if it's not resolving within a short time frame, you know, starting to improve within a few days, certainly reaching out to primary care and, and asking for a, a, uh, an appointment. Yeah. Uh what are the most common causes of back pain? Like, is it 
position of sitting, standing position or heavy weight lifting? What are the causes you see in your practice? We actually, believe it or not, in most cases, we do not actually identify a trigger when we're referring back to the patient's history. It can be quite a, a spontaneous onset. Uh, but when we dig a little bit deeper, it often involves there having been a change in mm -hmm. the patient's day-to-day -day activity, either with travel or a ski trip or some sort of change to your typical pattern, or having been sick and spent more time lying in bed, having gotten away from your normal exercise routine. Do you think sitting position is one of the common triggers? Well, that is the new saying, you know, sitting is, is the new smoking. Yeah. Yes, I do believe the amount of inactivity that our lifestyles are predisposed to nowadays. We sit at work, we sit to drive the kids to their activities, we sit to watch their activities, and we're really far more inactive than we were historically. And that can be one of the triggers for the initiating the low back ache? Initiating low back pain and, and yeah. earlier wear and tear in the lower segments of our back. That yeah. So what sort of position would you recommend, sitting position, to prevent the back ache or back pain? Well, we, we obviously recommend, um, if needed, doing a proper ergonomic setup. But rather than focusing on, on the proper sitting, we actually encourage you to change positions as often as oh. possible. Okay. The recommendation of finding a couple of minutes to get up and walk every hour, um, do a flight of stairs, walk down the hallway, and then come back to your desk. If you're taking a phone call, you could do it standing up and then go back to your computer work. It's really about changing your position. So not to sit at the one position more than 40, 45 minutes at a time. Correct. Probably, and then yes. keep on walking around. Uh, and if you have a long drive or a long flight that you're ensuring that you get up and you walk around okay. and, and you stand and just yes. to change the position, even doing some gentle supported backwards arching if that yes. feels good. Yes. Now. Um, when one has to go to a doctor, um, when the symptoms worsen, what is the indication or what is the flag sign, you can say, that you have to go to a doctor rather than treating at home? Sure, there are certain um, you know, flags if it's associated with um, uh, fevers. If you're having night pain, that's very severe and unrelenting. And it really doesn't change no matter what position you're in. Medication doesn't touch it if it's associated with weight loss, um, and if really there's no position of comfort um, after a few days of dedicated self-care, if it's really unresponsive, then it may warrant a visit to your primary care provider. Sometimes patient with the back pain gets a tingling numbness in the legs or bladder or difficulty. Absolutely, if there's, if there's symptoms other than the back pain, back pain. The, the concerning ones would be unrelenting leg pain, leg weakness, mm -hmm. uh, leg numbness, and then uh, it, people can get confused with bowel and bladder symptoms, but it's really inability to control the bowel or um, inability to urinate when yeah. you know you have the urge. Yeah, sometimes patients with a cancer have a metastatic disease to the bone and they might get a backache, right? Certainly. In that case, uh, they might want to consult a doctor patient with the cancer getting back pain. Absolutely, if there's been a past history, not in your family, but of you yourself, mm -hmm. um, of, of having cancer, then it would make sense to have more, more significant screening. Yeah, patient with the smoking, are they risk factor for the more risk for the um, back, pain, back pain? Yes, actually, um, the blood vessels and the blood supply to the back are significantly affected by smoking, it causes vasoconstriction and it really does impair mm -hmm. the body's ability to heal more quickly from a routine uh, kind of typical episode of back pain. One of the common back pain patients see is after the pregnancy or during the pregnancy. Do you want to say something about the back pain and the pregnancy? Yes, it is a, a, can be a common occurrence and it's typically due to laxity of the ligaments that are associated with the hormones that support a pregnancy. And obviously the, the change in dynamics as, as the belly grows, um, you know, if you hold a baby out here, your mm -hmm. arms tire very quickly. When you hold a, a baby close, you can hold much longer. It's the same thing for the spine. If you have uh, a belly going out away from the spine, the muscles fatigue much more quickly and your tolerance for standing and walking decreases. So what would you recommend uh 
to prevent the back pain during and after the pregnancy? Yes, uh, dedicated core strengthening, uh, safe abdominal exercises, safe back strengthening exercises, and safe cardiovascular exercise. We know that back pain responds to healthy cardiovascular exercise, be it biking, swimming, or brisk walking, whether that's due to an endorphin release, the chemicals that, that feel good going through your bloodstream, uh, the evidence just supports uh, remaining active. Sometimes patients have a back pain and they are recommended exercise, but they are scared or feared sure. that uh, exercise might aggravate the back pain. So yes. what to do in that case? Well, it's an old misconception that we're trying to get rid of. You know, we were told many, many years ago that if you had back pain, you should just rest, rest, rest and stay in bed. And we know that, that that is not the right advice anymore, that actually inactivity will cause further deconditioning and weakening of the muscles. Mm -hmm. And the less you do, the less you can do. And every time you try and uh, regain your activity level, your body may push back. So we really do encourage safe activities. And that can be guided through um, um, your family doctor, nurse practitioner, your physiotherapist or chiropractor or some good online resources on how to stay active safely. And that's something we try to provide patients with those resources when they see us in the right. program. So even there is a backache, it is good to do guided exercise. Absolutely. Because otherwise it will aggravate more pain. Correct, probably. but there's often specific guidelines on which ones to do and which ones to avoid. And that's where you might wanna seek expertise to get going. Yes, when is the complete bed rest recommended in the backache or back pain situation? Sorry. When is the complete bed rest recommended? Is there any situation where somebody has a back pain and you recommend a complete bed rest? Uh, not very often. Uh, certainly with an acute new onset episode, sometimes the muscle spasm and the pain can be quite disabling. And really in the first two to three days, even up to two to three weeks with something like an acute disc herniation, it can be very, very difficult to do anything. So at that time rest is recommended? Uh, again, um, resting for too long will be aggravating, mm -hmm. yes. so you may not be able to do much, but those patients typically find that they still need to change positions, and it could be moving from lying on your back to lying on your side, doing a short walk, and then going back to rest again for the first okay. few days, and then it typically it should start to ease. Thank you, Carolyn. We'll take a short break and we'll continue the next part of the discussion uh, shortly. Thank you. Welcome back to the show, Talk With Your Doc. Uh, today we are talking about um, risk factors, management and prevention of back pain. And Carolyn Fanti is here with us. Uh, thank you, Carolyn. So once a patient uh, with the back pain comes to the hospital, is referred by a physician, uh, what sort of investigations he undergoes? Uh, X-ray, MRI, what sort of treatment investigations are recommended? So, as I mentioned, we typically recommend that patients come without any imaging at first. Uh, we, we actually get the most information taking a very thorough history and a thor thorough physical examination, examining the nerves, the muscles, and also a movement pattern screen. That gives us a lot of information. And at that point, if we find certain signs and symptoms, um, that warrant further investigation than we recommended at that time. Uh, typically, we would start with an x-ray unless we're seeing um, c more concerning symptoms that we talked about earlier, unrelenting back pain, um, you know, night pain that's not responding to anything, uh, weight loss, then, then more tests may be ordered. Uh, we'll also consider ordering something like an MRI if there is a significant leg pain that's lasting typically beyond a three to six week duration or is associated with progressive weakness. So not all the patients need MRI to diagnose it? No, actually uh, we would say less than 10% or even less than 5% of patients need an MRI. And typically that would only be those that have the leg symptoms such as weakness and, and signs. Because of, sometimes patients insist that they need MRI. 
Well, uh, patients feel, uh, or they, they might think that an MRI will give us more information to explain why they're having back pain. Mm -hmm. And what we tell them is that an MRI actually doesn't explain back pain, it explains leg pain associated with something in the back. Mm -hmm. But that's typically, um, we get that information from our physical examination and we use an MRI only for surgical planning. Yes, so no yeah. need of MRI every patient. You know? No, absolutely not. So basic investigation will be that X-ray, that is the required. And only, only in those patients that aren't resolving in the normal expected time frames right. of six to 12 weeks from that first episode. So when is the patient referred to a surgeon? So a patient would be referred to a surgeon, uh, there, there's certain fancy terms, but basically if, if they have signs of a disc herniation that are causing leg pain in a certain pattern that's not improving, again, 95% of disc herniations will resolve without an operation. And in our older population, if they have something called spinal stenosis and they're noticing that they cannot stand or walk for more than a few hundred yards, mm -hmm. um, that may warrant an MRI and a surgical intervention. Those are the two most common. And then obviously there's, there's a list of other conditions that are you know, much less typical. Disc herniation, is it same as the slip disc? A sl yes, yes. A, a slip disc is not actually a correct Cur term. Okay. A, a disc that herniates can either, it can bulge, it can herniate, or it can even break off, which is called... Can you explain a little bit about the disc and how does it bulge or herniate? Sure. A disc is actually like a tire, um, mm -hmm. and the outer um, material of the disc is very fibrous and, and tough. Um, but with certain injury or wear and tear, you can get little tearing in the outer fibrous fibers of the disc and then the inner material which is a little bit like a jelly donut mm -hmm. can actually ooze out a little bit and if if it does too much then what it will do is is put pressure on a nerve and then patients will start feeling that leg pain mm -hmm. and they can also get chemical irritation from that jelly like material against the nerve and it t causes an inflammatory type pain which is often why we recommend anti-inflammatories in the beginning and what is the common cause for the slip, slip disc or disc herniation? We typically see it in our younger patients, age 25 to 45. Um, and, and it can be, uh, again, it's usually not one incident. It's usually the straw that broke the camel's back in a series of minor incidences that add up, be it um, too much bending, uh, lifting incorrectly, lifting a heavy load and twisting, um, a really bad cough, um, a long flight those types of things. Now, uh, many people who do not have backache, um, if you do MRI, you might find some disc herniation there, right? I love that question. We could MRI 100 people off the street that don't have any symptoms, and a very significant proportion of them will have minor disc herniations. Mm -hmm. We differentiate. We say it's either a surgical grade finding or a non-surgical grade finding, and most of us have non-surgical grade findings. So we findings. don't have to worry about all the disc herniations, right? No, no, no. we don't. <laughs> um, you know, it's the changes that show up on MRI are often normal age-related changes, yes. like wrinkles and gray hair hair and they don't represent pathology. So don't have to worry about all the disc herniations. No, <laughs> no. So w to prevent disc herniation or low backache um, or back pain, what do you recommend as a physiotherapist for the people to improve in their lifestyle, yeah. sitting, standing posture, food? How, what would you recommend? Yeah, so um, maintaining an, an ideal body weight, we, we usually use the term be as light as you can be, whatever that looks like for you. Avoiding smoking, um, avoiding prolonged positions, um, too much sitting particularly, and trying to engage in a minimum of 30 minutes of dedicated uh, exercise. cardiovascular exercise, be it walking, biking, swimming, and also about 15 minutes per day of dedicated core strengthening for the abdominals and the low back. Mm -hmm. uh, so with the exercise, it will keep your mobility and everything flexible and you may not get the pain. It will help to prevent or actually reduce the frequency that you may experience back pain. It's really about management rather than cure for some patients. Right. Is there any online resources you would like to recommend people to refer to? Any website they can? 
Yes, so the, know Isaac, more about it? the Isaac website is isaac.org and they've got wonderful resources there uh, that patients can access. And then for knowing whether or not an, uh, an MRI or an X-ray is required, we, we like to recommend choosing wisely and the guidelines they have. Does alternative therapy like yoga, acupuncture help to reduce the low, low back pain? There's lots of tools and some tools work for some patients and not others. So we really encourage patients to explore what works for them. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and once somebody's cured of the back pain, say, then they have to maintain the lifestyle, otherwise we'll come back, right? Probably. Well, the lifestyle changes. If, if you're doing all the right things and avoiding the wrong things, and that's what we help patients with through our program, you decrease the chance of having what's called recurrences. Right. Thank you, Caroline, for coming to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, everyone.